Thank Hi. you, Kevin. Great good to morning. see you. I'll go ahead and set you want to sit there. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, Kevin, this is great to have you here. Thanks so much for kicking off the sixth year of the GeekWire Summit. Wow, good morning, everybody. Yeah, it's great. It's great, Todd. So I want to start with a little bit of your personal story. A lot of folks know you as the guy who ran Windows, the, the CEO of Juniper Networks. How did a tech guy end up running Starbucks? Well, Todd, I guess uh, my Starbucks journey started, uh, as you said, in 2009. It was shortly after Howard Schultz had stepped in as CEO. And if you recall, it was sort of in a very tumultuous period. There was a macroeconomic meltdown, and Starbucks was in a, in a period that we called transformation. And so Howard invited me to join the board and be a part of the transformation agenda that Starbucks was driving at the time. So my journey began in, in 2009, you know, and I'd say I, I always loved Starbucks coffee, and in uh, the almost nine years that I've been there, I fell in love with the company. Uh, but really, you know, five years ago, I would not have predicted this. Uh, it was about five years ago, uh, as CEO of Juniper Networks, that uh, you know, I went to an annual physical, as we all do, and uh, was diagnosed with melanoma. And so immediately faced with, uh, dealing with that health issue, and I found at the time I was still trying to do my, uh, fulfill my responsibilities and travel around the world. I was having to reschedule doctor's appointments and cancel doctor's appointments, and, and one day, as I was about to get on an airplane to fly to Europe, uh, I, I stopped and, and asked myself, you know, why am I doing this? Why am I not, through my actions, prioritizing what is most important, my health, my family, the people I love. And so I decided two things at that moment. Number one, that it was time for me to retire after 32 years in the tech industry. And number two, and perhaps most importantly, I decided that for the rest of my life, no matter how short or how long that may be, that I will only do things that are joyful with people I love. And so my wife and I retired, moved back into our home in Seattle, and had the opportunity to focus on my health issues and stayed on the board of Starbucks, which I loved. And one day I was down at the support center having lunch with Howard and Howard said, you know, Kevin, uh, you know, you should come be a part of the Starbucks journey as a partner. Help, help, help me, help our partners uh, with this next phase of the company. And so I had to give that some thought, but I, you know, I'd say after you know, a month or so of talking to Howard about this, uh, it was really my wife that, that gave me the clarity. It was at dinner one night. My wife, June, said, uh, Kevin, I know you've been talking to Howard about this. And she said, I just want you to know uh, that I think you love Starbucks. I know you love Howard. I see the joy it brings you. If this would be fun for you, you should consider it. If it's not fun, don't consider it. She said, but whatever you do, don't look back 10 years from now and say, I wish I would have. And so I knew at that moment that this is what I was destined to go do. And that's when I uh, joined the company as a partner two and a half years ago. And then from there, obviously, you became CEO earlier this year. You are taking over Starbucks as CEO at such an interesting moment in time. There's a digital disruption. There's a retail disruption uh, going across the industry. And in fact, you said that retail is going through a massive disruption. What is that disruption, and, and how is Starbucks navigating it? Yeah, I think, you know, first of all, if you look at, at sort of uh, what's happening in the entire retail sector today, is this shift of consumer behavior to doing more and more purchases uh, online. And that's just accelerated with the, with the advance of mobile, the mobile internet, mobile devices, and so as a result, especially in the U.S., uh, the, the United States is over-retailed. There, there are more brick and mortar retail outlets than can be supported in, in, this, in this disruption. And so, you know, you ask yourself, why is it in a period where there are more brick and mortar retail closures than any other time in history, is it that Starbucks continues to be able to build 2,000 new stores a year globally, and those stores continue to operate at some of the highest uh, revenues that, that, that we've had versus prior generations? And I think this disruption just highlights that, uh, two things that we think are, are important for all retailers to consider. 
One is you must be focused on experiential retail that creates an experience in your store, brick and mortar store, that becomes a destination for the customer. Number two, you've got to extend that experience from brick and mortar to a digital mobile relationship. And so, you know, our approach to this is we are investing in elevating the experience that we create in our stores, uh, and we are investing in the digital mobile connection we have with our customers. And we think at the end of the day that that will serve us very well. I want to dive into both of those topics. Let's start uh, just a, a short di drive from here in Capitol Hill. Uh, this is the Starbucks Roastery. Uh, on Capitol Hill. Well, we're, we're in a very unique location here at the Sheraton. I mean, you, you go down Pike to 1912 Pike, and you've got the very first Starbucks store. You go up Pike Street, and you have the Roastery, which is um, the ultimate high-end uh, experience around all things coffee uh, that we, we opened uh, about three years ago. And it's just the first in what will be many of them. You and I got a chance to sit down and I was buzzing after this conversation, not just because of the uh, 20 pints of caffeine that I consumed, but because it was fascinating there. I mean, this place is really the, the Willy Wonka of coffee. You've got the roasting going on on one side. You've got the ground coffee going up through pipes over to the, the partners and the baristas on the other side. I mean, this is an amazing place. How does this reflect the future of Starbucks retail? Because you can't build one of these on every corner, can you? No, we're not going to build one of these on every corner. We do have four more of these under construction and one more being designed. In fact, uh, three weeks ago, I visited uh, uh, the roastery in Shanghai, China, that is three times the size of the one here on Capitol Hill. Uh, it will open in early December, uh, and it will be a phenomenal uh, experience for customers. Last week, I was in Milan, Italy, uh, and visited uh, the roastery that we are building in Milan. It is uh, one block off of the Duomo in a beautiful uh, building that was La Poste, used to be the post office in Milan, and it, it too will be phenomenal. New York City, Tokyo, Chicago. So we are building these roasteries in iconic flagship cities around the world. And these roasteries in many ways are uh, a center for, of innovation for us. And when I think about our agenda, in many ways, um, uh, innovation is at the core of Starbucks. Innovation in all things coffee, and you had a chance to, to taste and experience some of the, the new coffees that we're doing, whether it's uh, draft nitro cold brew or whiskey barrel aged uh, coffee. I think that was my favorite. I, I know you liked that one. It was early in the morning, and I know you liked that one. <laughs> um, innovation in store design. Uh, innovation in our digital platforms, innovation in the benefits that we offer to our partners, and innovation in our social impact agenda. And in many ways, these roasteries are a center of innovation for us. That's where you see some of the new store design concepts. That's where you see some of the new coffee experiences that we create. Uh, we're doing some very interesting things on digital innovation that, ma that makes its way uh, through the roasteries. And all these things ideally will start to they propagate out to all of the Starbucks stores around the world. You know, we're now uh, over 27,000 Starbucks stores in 75 countries. Uh, we have 330,000 Starbucks partners. That's what we call the, the, the baristas that work for Starbucks. Starbucks partners who proudly wear the green apron, serving over 90 million customers a week. So innovation is required for us to continue to be relevant to our customers, to create a fresh new experience, and to ensure that, uh, that we can continue to grow. What do you say to people who hear those numbers and say, that's way too many Starbucks, Kevin? You're building too many, you're going to have to pull back. Because I know Starbucks has you know, expanded and contracted over the years. Why is now the time to keep expanding, and, and, and how do you make that case? Well, you look, you look at the two large countries that we have opportunity for growth. The United States, and you know, we started in the United States, and we've got, certainly got more stores in the United States, uh, but also China. And if you look at China, you know, we're now at about uh, 2,800 stores in China. We just, uh, we just invested about $1.3 billion to acquire the other 50% of the joint venture in East China. So we've now uh, unified mainland China as a company-operated market. If you look at the fact we've been in China for 18 years, and as we entered China, we, we entered with a view of taking a long-term approach, being respectful to the culture, 
and the Chinese and the way we would design stores and the way that we would create community uh, in that marketplace, the way that we would offer special unique benefits for our Chinese partners. And so we've now grown to about 2,800 stores in China. But if you look, we have, with, with you look at the grow, growing middle class in China, uh, you look at the, the opportunity for, for more and more people to frequent Starbucks, we can build stores in China for decades and still have, and still have runway to build wow. more. Wow, okay. So, and that's fascinating because of the, the mobile first approach there and how everything's different, which I want to get into in just a second. But before we do that, I want to introduce you to this gentleman. This is far from Shanghai. This is in Ballard, Washington, at my neighborhood Starbucks. Perfect. This gentleman's name is Gary Howlett. Uh, I found him uh, in the corner of my Starbucks. He is the ultimate Starbucks geek. He is a gold Starbucks rewards member. And here's the interesting thing about Gary. He travels to Vietnam four months out of the year to train teachers. And he goes to the Starbucks there as well. I asked him what I should ask you. He wants to know, how do you globalize the culture? How do you create a consistent experience while staying true to the local culture? Because the baristas he interacts with in both countries take a very similar approach in a lot of ways, even though they're there, there for different reasons. Some of them are you know, just in college, moving up in the United States, perhaps, and some of them are in a career in Vietnam. Can you tell me sort of how you address uh, Gary's questions about globalization? Well, it's a great question. With over 330,000 partners around the world that proudly wear the green apron, how, how, how do we create that? And, and the answer is, is really uh, fairly simple. Our mission is to inspire and nurture the human spirit, one person, one cup, one neighborhood at a time. So the core ingredient in what we create in our stores is number one, we build a beautiful store that creates a warm, welcoming environment. Number two, we provide the world's finest, most unique coffees and a coffee experience. But the most important ingredient is human connection. It's the baristas that learn Gary, learn your name, they know your favorite beverage, they, they welcome you when you come into our stores, and they are there to build you a handcrafted beverage to your preferences. And at the end of the day, it's about human connection. And you think about the one thing that every single one of us on this planet has in common. And I, I travel the world and I do round tables with our partners in the stores, I w you know, in Mexico, in Europe, in China, in Japan, in the US, and everywhere I go, and I sit down and hear the stories of these people. They share their life journey. And the one thing we all have in common is the human experience. We've all experienced joy and sorrow. We've all experienced the, the, the struggle and the success. And so just anchoring on the fact that human beings, we're, we, are meant, we are tribal people. We get energy from one another. And if you create an environment where people are connecting with other people in our stores, it works everywhere. Okay, so that's great. I do have, I do have to tell you, Gary has some issues. I'm sure he does. Yeah. So one of them is he wants the mobile app, the rewards program, to work just as it does in the United States and Vietnam. He wants it to be a global unified experience. He says you have some work to do. How far are you away from that? He's right. We have some work to do. Well, we, uh, we have uh, you know, now deployed that consistent experience across a number of countries, US, Canada, the UK, most recently Japan. And uh, the key factor is some software that the teams are writing. And you know, that software is rolling out uh, country by country around the world. And it might take us another two years to touch every country. But we've, in, in our Starbucks technology team, they are creating what's called a unified commerce platform which allows us now to have, uh, have our rewards program and have uh, mobile payment, mobile order and pay in a way that can work with, uh, with the infrastructure in any of these countries. So he's right in uh, Vietnam, we're not there yet, but we will be someday. Okay, I'll, I'll let him know when I meet him uh, some morning soon. Okay, so let's dive into this digital innovation in, in particular, which I know is obviously a key topic for this audience in particular, mobile order and pay. You, go onto your phone, you order your coffee, and you get to skip the line, much to the consternation of the people who haven't figured this out yet, which is approximately 91% of the audience, because about 9% of your US company-owned store uh, transactions are mobile order and pay at last report. I know you're in your quiet period, that number's probably gone up, but you can't talk about it. So this has actually disrupted your retail experience, because 
People are going in, they're go not going to the line that they used to, they're going to a different line. How has this forced you to adjust and did the success of mobile or order and pay surprise you? Yeah, I think this is uh, similar to other transitions we've gone through. For example, when we, uh, when we first added drive-throughs in some of our stores, we had to figure out how do we now, uh, we have another channel where customers are ordering their food and beverage at drive-through and how do we then operationally handle that, uh, handle that volume. And certainly the success of mobile order and pay, you know, over a one year period, you know, really took off. And, uh, you know, created a situation where we had to re-engineer some of our processes in that store to provide the kind of customer experience that, uh, that, that we, we aspire for. You know, some of the changes had to do with, uh, you know, simple things like where do we consolidate all the mobile orders to have a nice handoff plane and a nice experience for those customers. Some of it involved technology. We deployed uh, what's called a digital order manager in our stores that gives us telemetry on the arrival rate of the orders and it helps, it helps our partners in the stores sequence the, the beverages and orders and also notifies the customer when their order's ready. Some of it has just been process in terms of how, uh, you know, how we do sort of time and motion studies and how we work with our, our partners in the stores to create the team to be able to handle the increased volumes. And you know, fortunately, over the last six months, we've seen the, the throughput increases at peak. We've seen the customer satisfaction scores go up. But uh, we, you know, we, had to, we had to make a number of changes. Uh, and we always will as uh, we continue to grow in our stores, uh, figuring out how to provide that, uh, that special Starbucks experience each and every time requires us to be you know, constantly innovating. Do you envision a day when the majority of transactions at Starbucks are made through a mobile phone in advance as opposed to just on the, the rewards card on the phone? Card on the phone? Well, that's, that's entirely possible that that, that could happen. I think that um, you know, the fact that we've got such reach in the number of customers that, that visit a Starbucks, you, know, you think about it, we serve over 90 million customers a week in our stores. And you know, we see a growing percentage of those using the mobile app and mobile payment. For example, in the United States, 30% of all tender we take is paid for on our mobile app. So 30% of all payments comes in, in, in the form of mobile. Uh, oftentimes, the, those are customers that stand in line at the point of sale, order, and then pay with their phone. Uh, in China, uh, we already see roughly 50% of all payment being done on the mobile app, uh, mobile, mobile payments with, uh, with 10, with Tencent and with Alibaba, TenPay and Alipay, uh, very popular payment vehicles. So, you know, it's easy to see payments going above 50%. 50 Still, many customers like to come in the store, and they want that, that experience in the store, and many customers want the, have the need state of convenience. And so we have, to, we have to do both and do both well. Yeah, you talked about those need states when we met. You've got the convenience and then the connection. Right. Those are the two need states that you're solving for. And so one is the connection through things like the roastery, the other is convenience here. Well, roastery and, and uh, you know, in our 27,000 Starbucks stores, you know, many customers go there. They go there with their family, with their friends, with their colleagues, and, and they go there to, to have a conversation over coffee. Uh, sometimes they go there just to ha have a connection with, with the baristas in the store. So this need state of connection is something that I think is a special attribute of Starbucks. You know, in China, for example, in the United States, the peak is in the morning. It's usually between 8.30 and 10.30 in the morning. That's the peak part of our day. In China, it's 1 p.m. to 3 p.m. And in China, it's after lunch, and it is a, it's the need state of connection. It's customers that come in, and they want to they buy a coffee or tea, beverage, and maybe a, a bakery item, and they sit down, and they want to have a conversation. And so that need state of connection is an important part of what we do. It strikes me that in a lot of ways, you and Amazon are going to the same place from different directions. Amazon is a traditional digital retailer, uh, which is obviously rolling out a, a large number of physical retail stores. You're a traditional physical retailer that's getting more into digital. Do you watch what Amazon does? And, and, and to what extent do you think you could adopt things that they're testing or learn from what they're doing? Well, certainly we watch Amazon. We watch everyone in the industry, I think. Um, you know, in, in watching Amazon and others, it reinforces this, this principle of the combination of, an ex, of a retail experience that involves a brick and mortar store combined with a digital mobile connection is, is the ingredient for the future. And so uh, some, like Amazon, started on the technology side, the digital mobile connection, and now they're moving into exploring more around brick and mortar. 
Starbucks, we started around the brick and mortar and we're moving more towards digital. And, uh, and I think you see that with you know, most every major retailer, certainly in food and beverage, but I think you also see it in, in uh, mass merchants and apparel and other, other scenarios as well. It's interesting because Amazon is conducting one of, one of its experiments literally in your parking lot at the Starbucks headquarters in Soto here in Seattle. Their Amazon Fresh Pickup, one of their two locations, is right in front of you. It makes it easier to watch them. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> they're, they're, not, they're not hiding. Could you envision a day when you and Amazon are tighter partners and, and work together? Well, sure. I mean, we, uh, you know, we, we work to sell some of our products on Amazon, and you know, we have dialogue with them. And so uh, you know, we, you know, we look to partnerships with a number of you know, wide range of com companies. You know, we've got a partnership with Spotify on music, a partnership with Lyft on some things that we've done with them. And so you know, I would say we are, we v we're very uh, open to, to the partnerships that, that create synergies. I got three words for you, Kevin. Drone delivered coffee. No, I guess I take it that's well, no, no. I mean, you know, look, all you know, delivery. Uh, look, we did a delivery pilot in the right, U.S. with Postmates. We did a delivery pilot in the U.S. with Postmates. Yes, and uh, what we found was uh, the fee for the Postmates delivery was roughly five dollars, and our average ticket is roughly five dollars and fifty cents. So, you know, customers spending five or six dollars uh, were reluctant to pay a five dollar delivery fee. So, you know, the, the key on delivery of food and beverages, once you get up around a thirty dollar ticket, then that delivery fee will make sense. Now you say, oh well, with drones, maybe the cost goes down. That's probably, that's probably true. There may be some FAA things that have to be figured out, but, uh, you know, I think delivery is, is a part of the scenario. And, uh, you know, and I think there's a wide range of uh, technologies and things, drones included. Are you working on your own drones, or are you going to work with Amazon on that? We're not working on our own drones. Okay. We right. we've got other priorities to do yeah. right now. That would be something we'd look to, uh, you know, to partners who are who are much more drone literate than we are. Got it. Well, we've got Jeff Wilkie coming up later today, so Perfect. I'll see if I can make that connection for you. Perfect. <laughs> Thanks, Doc. Okay. Um, so, on the theme of technology, you actually are using virtual reality in some interesting ways. And we have a video of essentially the transition from a CAD store design to virtual reality. And we're going to go ahead and play that now, and then we can just sort of explain what's happening here. Can you narrate this video for folks? Yeah, what, what you're seeing is uh, the rendering of a new store design. You know, we, we design every single store around the world as a snowflake. No single store is the same. And so we have a team of store designers that sit and they, they draw the stores, they, they do the CAD drawings, they design everything. They design the furnishing, they curate the artwork, they design uh, the layout of the stores, the bars, the lighting. And uh, just in this last year, our Starbucks technology team has worked with store development so that they can take that CAD drawing and with the click of a mouse, translate it into a virtual reality environment uh, skin that environment, and so we have designers now can walk a store and see what it's going to look like before we start deploying capital to actually build it. And so what you're seeing is a rendering of a store uh, that was designed uh, by our store design team, and so this has become a tool that they use to give, to give them much more of a visual. Before we had this, they used to go into a, a floor in our building and actually put tape around sort of the, the, the layout of what the store was going to be so that they could get sort of a visual perspective. Now they can do it through virtual reality. So that's one example of how we're using technology internally to help facilitate uh, store design. What advice based on that would you give other folks in the room, uh, business leaders, technology leaders, who are thinking about ways to incorporate virtual reality into their own companies? Did you, have you learned lessons that, that of things that don't work with AR, VR? Or? Well, for us, you know, it was a combination of, of taking a practical uh, business process that we had to go through and figuring out how virtual reality could really transform that process. And, you know, so in this case, looking at something that has, you know, so a designer has to look at the visual aesthetics, they have to look at the, the physical layout of the store, and oftentimes they have to communicate with people who are not designers, who have a difficult time visualizing things. And so finding, uh, you know, utilizing visual re virtual reality technology has really helped bring those things together. 
you know, we've, we've experimented with other things. For example, uh, how can we give a customer a tour of our only, the, coffee, the only coffee farm we own in the world is Hacienda Alsacia in Costa Rica. And, uh, oh yeah, here's Victor, the farm manager. And uh, uh, we've worked on ways to help uh, give customers more of a, of, of a tour of what it's like at origin. What does a coffee farm look like? What do coffee trees look like? And uh, so we've created some things that are little virtual reality tours of a coffee farm as another example. So finding things that are practical or can create new experiences, I think, are very interesting with virtual reality. You've also experimented with something that a lot of folks are thinking about talking about implementing, and that is artificial intelligence, at least in the form of a chat bot. Uh, my Starbucks barista, the whole idea that you can talk to your phone uh, and interact with a virtual barista to make your mobile order. Is that just kind of a fun experiment, or do you see AI chat bots being an actual way that people really buy stuff? Well, I think it's an actual way people buy stuff. And the, the two areas that when I think about artificial intelligence and uh, predictive analytics and uh, certainly the chatbots is one. And the other one is the personalization software that we have now um, enabled in our mobile app. So for example, when, uh, when you uh, select an item uh, on mobile order, down below it will have some suggested items. Those suggested items are being suggested to you through some artificial intelligence that looks at your past purchases, looks at uh, things you like, maybe things you don't like, looks at what other people like you might have tried before, and suggests things that are contextually relevant to you. Uh, the, the star dashes. Every star dash. You know, it used to be that we would have a single star dash, and the star dash is is basically a, a game or challenge that says if, if you're able to do the following three things, you'll earn extra stars, more points for your rewards beverages. Uh, and it used to be that we would send out a star dash, same star dash to about a half a million customers. Everyone got the same one. Well, now through, uh, through our personalization software, we're able to target that. So everyone gets a unique star dash that is, is uh, relevant uh, to you and creates the scenario for you to have a more uh, enjoyable experience with Starbucks. How has that changed the engagement and the numbers that you're seeing? Because I can imagine that targeting people in that specific way, much like Amazon might recommend things yeah. or give you a different experience or websites out there, how has that changed things in terms of your engagement with the customer? Well, it's, it's been a significant uh, contributor to the increased frequency that we see in our, in our rewards customers, especially on the mobile app. I think this. This last, uh, the quarter before was public, I think we saw the engagement go up something like 18%, uh, just in terms of the frequency and the engagement of those customers. And so, you know, it is, it is something that works. And frankly, it's also driven uh, in improvement in the customer experience, because customers feel like, you know, if, if, if they like, uh, you know, the, the nitro, uh, the draft nitro cold brew, there's offers that align with what they like. If they like the Tivana, in tea infusions, it, it orients to that. So it's, it's increased customer sap, but it's dramatically increased engagement. It strikes me that you've run two of the most loved and hated brands in the world, Windows and Starbucks. They ignite <laughs> passions, positive Todd, and I negative. I said I want to do things that are joyful with people <laughs> I love. People are passionate. I mean, it's the kind of problem, even the people who are negatively passionate, it's the, you know, it's the kind of engagement that many companies would, would, would you know, die for, kill for. I mean, what have you learned about navigating fans and critics from Windows to Starbucks, and how have you applied the lessons that you learned in the tech industry along those lines, big tech brands, well, first, to Starbucks? I, I think this is, is, in some ways, a study of brands. And you think about brands that have an emotional connection to their customers, yeah. whether it's a consumer brand or a business brand. But having that emotional connection to the customer that's relevant to that customer, I think really requires three things. I think number one, you have to know what is your unique purpose in this world. And are, is that a values-based purpose? Do you know what you're good at and you're really good at it? Number two, you've got to continue to innovate. You've got to imagine the future and figure out how to keep that 
special purpose fresh and relevant for your customers, and that is equally important. And so when you look at, uh, you know, you look at, at, at sort of the brand framework, the third element is authenticity. And that authenticity is something that says, look, this isn't about marketing, it's about the experience. So our brand is really established every day and every week when those 90 million customers a week walk in our stores. And if they have a great experience in the stores and that experience is authentic experience around all things coffee, the ability to connect with baristas and feel you know, some sense of a, a, of a warm, welcoming third place that's, that's an ins inspiration and nurturing in a world that sometimes is, is, uh, is troubled, then we are being authentic to our brand. If we continue to innovate, we provide new things in our mobile app and new beverages and beautiful store designs, we'll keep the brand fresh. So I think it comes down to, you know, are you clear about what is your purpose in this world and is that relevant to your customer? Uh, are you authentic in how you create that? And are you imaginative to keep it fresh and healthy? And at the core, that's Starbucks. You were Satya Nadella's manager at one point at Starbucks. You, and Satya is now on the Microsoft, or is on the Starbucks board yeah, as so well. Yeah, so you could kind of say Starbucks is now my, my manager, I guess. Yeah, exactly, right, yeah. exactly, Satya is, yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. So. Uh, Tell us your observations, and obviously you worked at Microsoft for many years, about what Satya has done at Microsoft, and, and what do you think about when you look at the transformation of that company? He'll be here tomorrow morning, by the way. So. Yeah, first of all, you know, I have such respect for Satya. I mean, you know, his intellect, but more importantly, his values. You know, the, the thing that, uh, that has always been true about Satya is he is an authentic uh, leader that um, that is able to show vulnerability and through his vulnerability creates connection with people. And I think he has done a wonderful job at transforming the culture and I think, you know, the way he talks about it in terms of a refresh, which says, you know, you embrace all the good things that in your culture that got you to where you are, but then you figure out what do you have to reinvent now for the future? And I think he's really struck a nice balance in the way he's gone about that. So, you know, I learned from Satya, always have, and uh, great respect for him. Final question here. Paint me a picture, paint us a picture of Starbucks over the next three to five years. What will stay consistent in terms of the experience? Where will you be? How many stores might you have? Where are you headed over the next three to five years? Well, for me, I think, you know, a big part of what, uh, what's important to me is that, that we stay true to our mission our values and our guiding principles as, as we go forward. And that as we navigate this retail industry disruption, that, that we are investing for the long term. So you will see us build beautiful roasteries around the world. You'll see us bring a very high-end artisanal Italian bakery here to Seattle in Capitol Hill called Princi. And Princi will start to, to expand to other Starbucks roasteries around the world. You'll see us invest in taking the innovation that we get from the roasteries and propagate it throughout all of our Starbucks stores around the world. You'll see us continue to invest in our partners. We're gonna be innovative around the benefits we provide them, whether that is the Starbucks College Achievement Plan where we will, we will help fund the college education of our partners so they graduate debt free. Um, we will continue to invest in our people and we will continue to invest in the digital agenda. And so in doing that, you know, I'd say five years from now, and in many ways this transition from founder-led to founder-inspired, um, you know, oftentimes those transitions are some of the most challenging transitions any company will go through. And you know, fortunately for me, for us, Howard is still here and he's supporting and helping with this, but I do believe that you know, we are we are a company that's been around for 46 years, and I aspire for us to be one of those companies that has been around for 100 years. And so my view is this next five years will set the foundation for the next 50 years of Starbucks. And it will be a five years where we will, we will continue to stay true to our mission and values. We will invest in experiential retail. We will invest in the digital mobile experience. And we will stay true to taking care of our people and creating that unique Starbucks experience each and every time. 
Kevin Johnson, the CEO of Starbucks. Thank you very much for kicking off this year's GeekWire Summit. Thank you, Todd.